meeting uh, the order. I call this meeting the organizational focus committee to order Thursday, January 6th at nine o'clock, a little after 3 30. Um, myself and Dal of our organizational committee, uh, also work group members, uh, RISE work group, and uh, Lucy Dillon and Annie Pacino, work group members. Um, motion to adopt the agenda, Dal. So moved. Uh, carries unanimously. Minutes um, in process. Um, new business, discuss and take action on your best practice and initiative. So Val, you know, this is our kind of brain. If we don't have a particular item listed, this is our brainstorming session. If we have anything particular we want to bring up because we can't discuss these things outside of um, as the two member group at this point, uh, we can't discuss these things outside of the meeting so publicly. And um, I just kind of bring up one that I've been thinking about much as we currently triage applications to determine items for consent and consent with conditions. Um, I'd like you to consider the concept of trying to differentiate during the, somehow during the course of the meeting those items that once they get to past, once we identify that they're past the point of minor revisions, that they're directed to, and it, it looks like it's substantial revisions, they're directed to the design advisory. Um, design advisory being a slightly different animal than it has been in the past, knowing that our um, the historic structures and other advisory groups will often provide uh, comments that are not adapted um, by the HDC in their final motion. It seems to me that the design advisory group should be uh, uh, constituted of as many HDC members who want to sit and design at the table as, as they want to. Um, but then that way there's ownership in the final outcome as opposed to having it go to um, a couple of designers or architects who would volunteer their time, probably for a relatively short period because they find that the, the fruit of their advisement wasn't being heeded. Um, the idea, the overall idea is that we at the HDC, to, in my opinion, spend far too much time um, not issuing declarative statements as to what's appropriate with respect to the guidelines but instead getting into what can be changed and how to change it. And I think in the short term with over 110 applications currently on our docket, we need to kind of change how we're operating. I'm not suggesting it's a permanent thing, but it needs to be something that we can start to get through these things. Because I believe the issues at the HDC with the commission with respect to applications are have nothing to do with, with professional staff or not. It's self-inflicted. Um, we spend a lot of time on applications that if we just refer to the guidelines, we wouldn't be spending on. And I think that if there's a desire on the part of membership to spend that time, that's, that's great. But we should set up our organization to function that way, because that way people who put in for a minor element or a minor uh, addition or something that doesn't reach consent, are, they're not waiting six weeks to be heard. I just think that that's unfair. So I know that's a lot, but I didn't even really digest it all. But um, are you saying like it, it instead of waiting to come back to us, there's a group that will approve? We work with them, not approve it, or maybe they would approve it. Yeah, I don't know. But like that. as our, it would all be HDC. You know, there was been some discussion. I think it was at the select board. Well, let's have two HDCs. Well, I see that there's, and I'm not suggesting that that was necessarily what was intention. It was just you know they were presented with information about long wait periods, and I think you know whom, whomever said it was thinking, well, we we want to help. We want to come up with solutions. My concerns with that approach is that. Um, it creates a potential conflict between historic district commissions. It's also not a short-term fix. I'm looking to suggest a short-term fix so we can get somehow caught up and stay kind of caught up. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not it would be. It would be more income. It would be us. It would be. It would be what we're doing now, but we wouldn't sit through a meeting and do I it. I can't do anymore. No, 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 no. Listen, okay. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we meet more days. I'm suggesting we triage what we have. If you have something 
say we 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 have our agenda in front of us. We have just say for the sake of simplicity, 20 things. If we go through that list and we get to something and it is like this major long process, it goes to 6 p.m. And then we go to the next thing. Okay, oh, that's minor. Oh, what do you think of that? I like this, that, and other thing. Motion to approve. Okay, next one. Oh, this is gonna be a long drawn out one. Goes to 6 p.m. in line, something like that. So that the HDC in one meeting is still handling the workload, but we can start to advance these items that can be handled more quickly. And then this group, much like old business, would be rolled over for members who want to sit and do an actual design. Because we're doing design charrettes. We're not doing a regulatory. I mean, a regulatory board issues declarative statements relative to their regulations and their guidelines. And we're like designing at the table. And the problem with that is that there's so many applications that the people who have a small standard typical Nantucket edition are waiting around six weeks for a review if there's some reason it didn't go on consent, like maybe staff or one of the members felt, you know, minor things. Well, it would help, can I have you be on ASAP? Yeah. It would help if a lot of these applications were complete. Well, I mean, the number of applications for downtown without the date of the original structure right. is 70%. I mean, it's huge. But so when, I, I, I just entertain this for a minute. We, so when we get it, the Lucy, we have a, the added benefit of Holly who fills in all that detail. So with respect to dates and incompleteness, you guys may experience it. And that's something we're gonna take up with the advisory group discussion through the organizational focus committee in another week, how that stuff gets resolved. But I, my point is simply when it gets to the HDC, that's not typically an element of incompleteness. And if it is, it's one that staff has the authority to turn back. They well, can simply say no. They're not turning it back, though, in my experience was that they're not no. turning it back. And I'm not talking about the individual owner who it is putting in their own application and representing themselves. I'm talking about these people, players, who are up before the HDC week after week after week. I'm not going to name names, but right. it's, there's there's no excuse for it. Right. So, so, I mean, well, we're going to be taking up like so one of the things we adopted uh we brought back we brought forth 10 best uh practice procedures they're not regulations they're procedures that we adopted and one of them is that if an application is materially incomplete the staff have the authority and they have been requested to let the individual know that they need to submit the information and it won't be put on the agenda until it is so that and i'm not putting this on staff i'm just saying there are procedures in place and what they're new and we need to be working on how to make them work more consistently and better. Um, and it's a culture change and it's a, a bit of a thing that takes some time. But right now what I'm looking at is the biggest issue with the HDC commissioners advancing through applications is the amount of time we spend on this application versus six of these that are only you know this involved versus this involved okay. and i'm trying to wait just one sec because this is a commissioner discussion not, not to be yeah. but so what i'm trying to get is a straw concept out for discussion after you've thought it through and if we come to some agreement that will then present to the commissioners because if we keep going where we do one application and it's this involved, and we do one application and it's this involved, and we do 10 applications is this involved, but we do a bunch of these ones, all these people are the ones who are sitting in the queue and they're waiting and waiting unnecessarily. And I'm not saying that we add more days, I'm just saying we restructure how these are reviewed so that the, the people who have that the people who need a design review element get the HDC members to be doing the de design review, much as we're doing now, much as we did today in our meeting with Matt and everyone else. That's what's taken us so long. So I don't know how to fix it other than 
we and try I don't and really understand how that will work because if this person put their application in before this person, why should they get moved up? Because if it need if it's so involved that it needs to go to design advisory, then it should move to design advisory. And maybe we have a meeting, maybe our meetings are Thursday and we go through applications as we did today, but we don't we we just go through them and we say, yeah, the we've looked at these and all these fit into they these can be reviewed, reviewed and motioned on relatively easily. But these are not, these are more about the historic homes. I feel like we okay. don't historic homes, uh, applications for historic homes. I think we we're doing ourselves and the community um to some extent a disservice when we, you know, we we're we're kind of going through the course of the meeting and we're we it's a combination of things, right? It's like time, it's like we started for we ended at 30. We get a historic structure at seven. We're kind of beaten down. Any meeting you look, anything you ever look up online says meet for 50 minutes or less. And we're there for, you know, four and a half hours. And we get to historic structures and we're like, you know, we can be a little punchy or we can be a little not as adept at reading plans or something is happening. And in part because of the way the meetings are structured, they're not triaged. And we're mid, we miss things. Um, we have advisory groups who help. We have professional staff who help. But I just think there's a better way to structure our meetings. And I'm not saying I know what it is. I'm just trying to get that discussion started with an idea. That's all. And I'm um, combining that concept of have, starting that discussion with this idea that design advisory goes nowhere if it's not HDC members. Because it's going to be a group of, I mean, I'm talking about not comments from the advisory groups. I'm talking about that, like the design review, what did you call it before when you guys had it? It was a volunteer thing. Like the, Yale Parent. Yeah, design review committee or advisory, advisory, I forget, design advisory committee, something like that. So I just, I, I don't know, I don't know how to handle it. I just, I've been thinking about it and for a while and um, on and off. And the more we go through these meetings, I realize something has to change or we're never going to get caught up. The, uh, having a professional, another professional staff member is not going to change that aspect of our meetings. And that's the aspect of our meetings that makes these things draw out for so long. Well, we have a thing going on right now where we're all supposed to take turns looking at applications as board members to create a consent agenda. That is the, I, I'm struggling with how this would work. Okay, well then maybe and, just think about it and see what. Um, yeah. Just think about, is there some way we can change? What I'm asking you is to think about some way that we could change the way we structure meetings so that we can move the things that are simple and easy through the process. I don't mean simple and easy like, you know, we just stamp things. Oh, approved. I mean, we we look at them. We we understand them and then we so realize it's, kind of ca it's categories. Yeah, it's it's like a triage, you know, they somebody you're you're in a situation and people are coming through the door who are injured, you know, the people who need a band-aid go there. The people who need a stitch go there. The person who's got a broken back, he goes somewhere else and you know, he might get more attention quicker, but there's just a different way of handling it than we are now. And I don't know what the final solution is, but we're getting, how many applications are we getting a week, Desi? About 80. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're 108 behind as of Tuesday night. And um, there's a way to handle this. Get a recession. Yeah, I mean, that's would be, you know, in terms of, look, on the other side of it, there are people, I know in the field who have no more capacity to do the work. But at the same time, there are people, literally people's hopes and dreams. There are people who have family. There are people who need an addition. There are people who need the basement bedroom for their kids um, or who are moving. A recent example, couple move into the island and they need the basement. They're, he's a teacher or she's a teacher and he works, I think, for the hospital. And they have two kids and they got a tiny little house. 
and they asked me, well, how long is it going to take to get this done? And I explained to them that it's a little more involved than how long is it going to take. Um, anyways, I, I don't want to get much more into that. I just wanted to try and paint a picture so you understood what I was trying to accomplish. And if you had questions, I'd answer them. And it might not go anywhere. I don't know. I just I think we we need to give it some thought. That's our role as a for organizational focus committee. Not without you know adding more days to go and meet and all the rest of that. I just I have to think about yeah. it because what it sounds like is it's more work for the volunteer members of the commission. And can I ask a well, one thing though, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting any more work than we already do. I'm just suggesting we restructure how we do it. So but somebody has to come up with that arrangement. Well, but that's the light lifting, right? That's you put the framework and you determine a framework that seems reasonably likely to succeed. And then you start to fill in that framework it, by doing what we're already doing. And then if you got to tweak it, you tweak it. But yeah, the framework part takes some time. Like this, what we're doing now, we're mapping. This takes the most time in a sense. And we're like, here, let's use the analogy. You want to go on a trip. You can get in your car and you drive. And which is fine in some instances, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish, or you map out your route and you plan it out and then you actually go and do it and you can enjoy the process and enjoy and, you know, experience it and develop more fully. That's what we're doing here today with solar when we get to it. And what we've been doing is the mapping part. And then we're going to get into the traveling down the road part with the stuff we're talking about with the focus committee. I'm talking about discussing a map on how to do it. Then we have to identify separately who are the resources. Is it professional resources who help us figure it out so it's not the volunteers? Like it doesn't all have to come to me and you sitting here. Well, that's like that multi mini splits and the fences and all the rest of it. Yeah. I don't know. I got to think about it. Yeah, I, how I, it all works. Yeah, I I get you. And it may be that we just have several discussions about what might and might not work. Well, the advisory committee's back. Well, the advisory committee serve a role, but that's a different role. Um, and that we're working on because it's incredibly frustrating to be going round and round in a circle, and that's going to happen Thursday. That's why it's going to the organizational focus committee, so we can get a handle on it instead of talking about it for I don't know how many months has this been. And we've never actually talked about. That. Well, that's my point. Um, and there's more than just commissioner input. We need to balance uh, what's going on with staff and and the advisory groups, and everybody has a role in that discussion. As far as I'm concerned. Um, anyways, so and that falls under our kind of brainstorming best practices too. Uh, mapping and traveling. We're back to uh, the rise one group in solar. We're on page four of six. Uh, number eleven, uh, item C. Compare and contrast uh, comparable historic district solutions. Examples being comparable districts being of similar extent. Ground cover variety, ground cover, like how big is the historic district? Variety of historic resources, including whether they have a similar era and architecture. Do they have the rule settings we have? Is there a defined sense of place as Nantucket has? Um, our essence is an island that's, uh, that's an island as compared to the real world in America. You know, there's historic districts that are immediately adjacent to the real world. And um, I don't necessarily believe that our guidelines should be relying on their philosophies because it's a different philosophy. Can we make comment? Yeah, please. Can we defer this this section until Mary Bergman is? Yeah, I've read that already. I'm yeah. spinning our wheel. Yeah, and, she knows everything. Yeah, and, and actually, that's this was going to be a deferred. The next one. Um, Future roof. Um, this falls in the line of uh, importance without getting into the topic, but also priority. And I would say that we defer this one through the tail end. Uh, it's just forward looking and trying to map out some concepts um, for general public perception on what would be appropriate enough to install in the front of a historic home in town. 
I think we're a little early for that, and it's something we can pick up later in the process. Well, the technology, I mean, you know, is changing so much. Mm -hmm. But I think that, as I mentioned a number of meetings ago, that to have samples somewhere on a structure so mm -hmm. that you can see how they look at the, on the different planes and how light reflects from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Because if we make a mistake downtown, we're yeah. going to hear about it for the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah. and what update that mock-up when new technology exactly. emerges. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, if you and, want to see it, go down. And 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 I'm underscoring that in our the item is future, not like something that tech is currently on hand. Even the Teslas we look at would not be acceptable in most locations if, if visible from any location. Oddly enough, the technology hasn't changed that much aesthetically. And yeah, since, since the beginning. Well, maybe we can use one. Maybe we can invent something. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I I read an article about a. Like a thin film uh, cell mm -hmm. being developed, and in glazing also, so that glass will not yes. produce old. I actually have some information on that. Yeah, there's actually yeah, what company that was going to they they came in front of us like one time. Um, they were starting this. They were going to do this film that you can have them put on your windows that mm -hmm. would. Facilitate that. I know those guys. Yeah. That go, or did they not show up? No, we had one meeting and then it, it, I never heard anything again, but I got a bunch of brochures, so I should bring those and give them to you. That's, it. That's for the, the window section of the rise work. Group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, and there's some granular products and there's some different things. So, okay, so I just made some notes that don't sell glazing technique and those are that's just something that we'll pick up um at a later day and our uh, later point in our process um we can always map a little more once we start traveling uh general tip sheet uh, forward slash write in checklist please so um this would i i you know the way i envision that this is part of the updated guidelines and it's kind of a summary and it for me it doesn't make sense to rewrite the guidelines in a, in a checklist or a tip sheet. It's going to be, you know, a, a two part. Um, part one is the checklist. Part two is the tip sheet. And both reference the guidelines by whatever chapter or section so that people can, you know, we're again, we're not restating in the checklist or the tip sheet. The guidelines. We're referring people to the guidelines, which is something to just jump back for a second. If we did at our meetings at HDC, if we just said you need to refer to dormers on such and such a page, and we moved on to the next person versus talking about the dormer that's acceptable and so on and so forth, our meetings would go much quicker because we're not designing at the table. We're just referring to the guidelines, and then that's what this concept is: is we're, we're giving them the resources on a simple piece of paper to go into the guidelines and find what they need. And versus currently, we have this really wonderful narrative guideline uh, in, in, in all you know sincerity. Um, it's like a book, and it's something you can sit down on a Sunday and read uh, when it's raining out. But designers and architects don't pick it up and use it because it's not necessarily as accessible and we want our guidelines, our tip sheet, and our checklist to be acceptable. The point being is they need to interrelate. But that's what I'm thinking of. Then, of course, it's for new and existing structures, residential, commercial, puts permitting process, examples of reasonable and commercially unreasonable expectations, some context about the National Historic Landmark, and so on. So in the mapping process, where do we, are there other things we might want to add to this for later when we actually get into discussing this. I think that's pretty encompassing. I think most, if not all items would fall under all of these umbrellas. Um, feedback from the public or neighbors. Might be added there. Neighborhood appropriateness. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, all a neighborhood appropriate address. I mean, because the HTC doesn't get into what, you know, I mean, what the neighbor thinks. Yeah, for sure. Right? It's not, a the regulatory neighbor. body doesn't refer to, I mean, we want to hear it, we want to understand it, but because a good idea is a good idea. So if somebody brings up something we missed, obviously we should be listening to it and responding to it in a material way. But for me, it's more about the character and setting of a particular neighborhood. So like, like at the example of that fiasco out in Tom Nevers recently. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't appropriate for the neighborhood. Yeah. From, from, from the solar for any neighborhood. <laughs> from the solar perspective, um, you know, we talked about developments, right? And so there will be a guideline in the checklist. Um, and that could be referred back to a neighbor, but the neighborhood component of that would be included in this checklist so that we could refer people back to that. Right. 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 So it, it, acknowledging it here is simple. Right. And the other thing would be, um, you know, uh, neighbor or a butter mm -hmm. uh, involvement. And that may be not, that should be somewhere. Again, I'm making a note, find somewhere to appropriately incorporate this. That could be ultimately in the guidelines. So a neighbor has, like, this isn't just for people who want to do solar or an applicator or a designer. It's also for people who want to understand, well, my neighbor's doing it. You know, what is the HCC's role? What can they do? What can't they do? Um, and if there's something they can do, how do I best approach accomplishing that? So, I mean, it could be, you know, I'm not suggesting we're, you know, creating a, you know, what there's the tenant and the landlord and, you know, we're writing a tenant's, you know, tip book on how to beat up your landlord. Like, I'm, I'm not suggesting we're, how do I want to say this differently? I'm not suggesting we're creating a roadmap for neighbors who want to um, um, get a, a solar uh, application denied. I'm just saying it, it seems to me that in the guidebook, we want to also give them an understanding uh, of what role the HTC has. Well, shouldn't the neighbor or, or Bell Butters be notified anyway? Well, in terms of a, a in terms of a notification, that's I mean, that comes down to town meeting. So we that would be, but my point is, and I'm not I will get back to that, but my point is simply that if a neighbor is looking at the guidebook because they want to understand their side of the coin, they have a concern. They also need to understand what the HDC's actual role is mm -hmm. so that they can be productive in their argument. If they have a concern, they can express it and they can express the concerns that are relevant. They may want to collaborate. But they it, it yeah. may not be just contentious. Exactly. So well, I, yeah, I'm just looking at yeah, that. No, I appreciate yeah. that, but give them the tools to say, oh, well, there's a ground array and it's 10 feet off uh, the property line within the zoning parameters, but hey, what if we collaborate and what if we expand it and double the size? And then what happens if that's all I see out my kitchen window either? Well, it, right. So that's but if no one else sees it, then but but the, so there then it's solved. But so there are two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how a neighbor gets involved. What's the HTC role? Because they're it's it's something that bothers them, or how can they get maybe. Uh, a better understanding of to what the guidelines are and how it's acceptable to reach out to your neighbor to try and come up with, hey, you know what? I really like to get involved in this. Tom wants to do it and Debbie wants to do it, but you're the one who put in the application. Now that we know that all four of our homes are back up to each other, and we have this area where we can do a cluster that no one can see. Or one of those. Right, one of those. Mm -hmm. Then they have an idea of how to kind of they get a better understanding of how to get together. Yeah. Okay. Conversely, how to work together to meet to expand new guidelines. Okay. So we were going to skip that. Or no, that wasn't one we we're going to skip. That's a good one we didn't skip. Twelve. We skipped. Yeah. Uh, anything else on? On 13? No. Okay. Paired items. So this is where we start to get into the more uh, how do these affect 
decisions the HTC makes and how do they affect the community? Um, let me just back up a minute. These get into they, they, these fall into the concept of um, shared responsibility. So you come to the HDC and you have two, you have three stories uh, under the building code. A basement isn't considered a story, but you have three stories. Let's say a basement is ten feet tall, and you want a net zero home, and you have double glazed windows versus triple glazed windows and you have nano walls all those big doors that are filled with glass you have a pool um you have a cabana you have your three dwellings and all of them have 10 foot ceilings on on at least two stories depending on the size of the building three conversely you want to save the world which is a noble endeavor, but you want solar on your roof everywhere. And the HDC is horrible people who hate puppies, kittens, and old people if they don't approve it. There's not a notion in that scenario, which happens more frequently than you might think, of shared responsibility with respect to helping to preserve the character and setting of the historic district, including of the landmark of Nantucket, including the um, rule setting and having structures blend into the landscape. So what these, what this, what these series of groups 14 and 15 look at are what are the metrics that the HDC needs to be aware of to understand whether this application meets a threshold of shared responsibility or is there some mitigation that they're offering? Not I'm suggesting like trees, but in the grander scheme of things by installing their solar. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, you gotta be careful on mitigation. I mean, it's, you know, recently, you can put in all the trees you want and come back and come in at dust to cut them down. Well, and that's what we're gonna deal with in the traveling along the path discussion. I don't disagree with you. It's like an important part of it, but that's why we're trying to keep things segregated so we can focus in detail on topics as we go. Right now, we're going to get into some of these topics that relate to the overall concept. Yeah, man. Yeah, please. I I think this is this expresses where there's need for collaboration from groups outside of this group. Um, from a town permitting process, from um, from banks, where where are there shared responsibilities that we could advocate for um, that could expand the opportunity or define it in broader terms? And I think that's what that this is getting at. I think that this is suggesting. Um, um, no, but I'm going. I'm writing down what you're saying because it's it's a good. Yeah, Why? it may not it, it may not be implying, but I think this is an area where additional feedback could be really critical and mm -hmm. really useful. So, uh, so for instance, useful life, depreciation of energy return, actual use life, and actual depreciation of energy return. We need to collaborate with the DVW. How are these going to be? No, no. This is this. Well, is that like, is a big thing. This particular one A is we're trying to understand. We're trying to help establish a conceptualization conceptualization of permanence. How long do these things sit on a roof? And that isn't just born by how well they're constructed and how quickly they weather. It also gets into the concept of how quickly does the energy return diminish in our region? Okay. So this isn't something we, number A, we're necessarily going to do ourselves. This will be one we identify for an outside resource. My note says expert input. Yes, there you <laughs> go. Outside, so expert input. Okay, other thoughts on how we might accomplish that? I think really it boils down to expert insert, uh, input, outside resource. And then this, this will speak to in the shared responsibility, such things as like, 
Man, I don't want to go there. It's too much of a rabbit hole. Um, I think we can probably leave that one unless you guys have further comments on it for now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, current installation cost and rebate. Current cost of installation perhaps expresses a square foot above a buy-in cost. Um, so what you're getting back on what you put in. Um, and if there's a rebate on the electric cost itself. Now, again, these aren't having to do with architectural elements, but they inform the HDC with respect to the concept of shared responsibility. Um, more so they inform our work group so that we can come up with well-rounded recommendations that serve both the HDC's needs as a regulatory authority charged with preserving character and setting and promoting the economy that results from that on one side, but also the community who has a need. But we can't help, we can't do both of those if we don't understand what's really involved, right? We, we, if we don't know what's required and what the kind of costs are, you know, it's, it's a big animal. We have to have a broader understanding. I think your earlier example of the house with double versus triple glazed windows is a good example, just to stay focused on that mm -hmm. component of the building. So with double glazed windows, you might need 37 panels to provide power to that property. Yeah. But with triple glazed windows, it may go down to 20 and it changes the dynamic. And if you add them to the cabana of the pool and to the back side of the shed, which is accessible, now you only need 10 on the roof, right? So that shared responsibility becomes financial buy-in from the homeowner outside of the scope of just getting the aesthetic that they prefer or saving money on windows. Now they've reduced the loads of the building and changed the dynamic of the property as it performs. And so again, this is an example of collaboration because now we've got permitting issues attached to that. We've got zoning issues attached to that. We've got energy analysis and analytics by a herd rater or other third party attached to that. So that's what I was that's the point I'm trying to make earlier uh, now I, have, I didn't see that waste stream reclamation and so that's why I jumped on it as, no, 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 as an opportunity you're good go, go, but, go, go. but I think that teamwork um defining the roles defining the goals and then having a broader discussion with vested uh town groups um mm -hmm. is a critical component to all this and we can't do that until we know these metrics and, and these different goals that we're suggesting here. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's another layer at the end of this output, at the end of this result, of this group, where we'll say, well, here's, we've, we've got a lot of great ideas on the table already and we haven't even started. At the end of the day, the outputs that we come up with and the creative um, collaboration that we're going to have here, um, a lot of those things shouldn't go dead. And, and somebody either here probably here someone needs to guide that to a broader discussion at the end of the day so it's not just a report to the hdc here's what this work group has discovered that is an opportunity for the island mm -hmm. with building with that bucket in mind All right no that that thank you because that helps clarify what you were stating earlier in a way that um i understand and makes sense to me in the general in the overall concept for you guys, what are your thoughts on <laughs> get rid of the pool and the combine? Yeah, I mean, that, can yeah. That's well, that does, yeah. I, that's, I just, I, I mean, everybody's talking about trying to save energy and everything else. <laughs> but that's part, so that's going to be part of the discussion we have. And then, and then we pull other people in too, because, yeah, like if you want solar, but you want to have a cabana and pool equipment and a heated pool and you're going to run it all year long and we're getting rid of um our fossil fuel resource i'm not suggest i'm not getting into the, the politic. politic political side of saving the world because it's an important thing to do don't get me wrong but we need to have a full rational discussion that's not ideological on either side and that involves yeah. as simply as get rid of the cabana in the pool because or don't come to me saying you need you know 10,000 square feet of solar panels, and you're not willing to put them in a ground array when you have space for it. You want them all on your roof because it's cheaper for you to get the loan that way because you get your better return on your money. Like all those things come into play and we're gonna get into that. Um, I was told a number of years ago that the amount of fuel brought to the island in the summer is equal to that in the winter because of heating all these pools. 
Really? Mm -hmm. Now, when you remember, there were only two pools on the island not, not that long ago. Right. Their whole life up until. Well, we know how to make net zero pools with electricity and not gas, too. So that's the thing. Yeah. And I mean, the shared response. Not to say I'm a. I'm not advocating for pools. I'm just saying, and that's that part of this discussion, right? What are the technologies out there? How how can we respond and react um, within the guidelines that know that we've vetted the process? And, and we don't want to pick on pools and cabanas, cabanas either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because my small house has some things that I could do that would improve and, and lessen the amount of solar that I needed to be net zero. And I will never have a pool or a cabana. Right, but if I use the appropriate or or a super efficient heat pump, that changes the dynamic and changes the loads of my building. So I think that's where that's outside the purview of the HDC, right? To say these are the things that you have to improve. These are right. the things we're asking you to improve. These are the things that you could improve to lessen that burden on the well, aesthetic. Absolutely. I mean, I have my house is exactly two hundred and one years old. <laughs> I mean. I can't be changing my windows. Yeah, right. I can't and, do anything. I mean, you, I can feel the breeze go through, but you know what? I can, what am I going to do about it? You could put an interior storm in, but that's expensive, right? But if you did it, now you need seven less solar panels on your roof. Right, and that's where the shared responsibility discussion comes in. Is like, and the current guidelines get into, you know, it's they're not. Uh, they're, they're not extensive, but they get into really important points. And one of them is what have you done to conserve the energy? And we're not having that discussion around solar today. There's no discussion about conserving energy. I mean, I remember growing up and you turned off the light and you shut the door and you did these things. And now we're not, you know, solar is perceived to be this abundant resource, which it is, but we well, are the great lady. For all this stuff too. But, yeah. you, you know, it's- You don't count that. Well, we're we starting to. We're starting to, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not advocating for solar when I talk about this. I'm, I mean, I'm not advocating against solar. I'm just it's saying. Gas stoves. <laughs> so, lots of and gas fire pits, then. Yeah. So, okay. number 117 of our items, <laughs> I, I actually wrote that down, is we're going to focus on shared responsibility. And I think we might focus on that earlier in the process because it really gets to the Part of what we're talking about. What is, that, um, what is your definition of shared responsibility? Well, I said earlier, can I just replay the tape instead of going through this? Shared responsibility, I think the summary is that there is a give and a take, and the HDC determines how much give and how much take. But you, as an individual who wants solar coming in, as currently many people come in without any sense of a shared responsibility to protect the historic character and setting, including the rural setting of the historic landmark. Unless it's downtown, and I know some people will fight with us, but there seems to be this lack of concern for conservation of energy. And it's and that lack okay, of concern. Yeah. And, I just wanted to hear. It. Yeah. And we're not and not to be an ogre and not to say to someone you can't have solar, but they're just I'm just trying to introduce that concept in the discussion because we're not high ass. We're not the vineyard. The vineyard has what? How many historic? They have small historic districts. I think they have five historic districts and they're tiny. Mm -hmm. And so when they they're protecting, we're protecting the historic district commission is trying to protect the historic landmark. Yeah, do this, yeah. The vineyard or here. Vineyard. Yeah. So I just the point is. When you come through the door, part of your responsibility is to have done what you can reasonably and not just be asking for everything plus your Christmas list. It's to keep to have some honor and try um, and try, you know, respect, I should say is a better word. Some of the uh, rule and the historic character setting elements that make Nantucket Nantucket. Does that mean you can't have solar? No. But does it mean that if we go through these other steps and we understand that your property reasonably needs 1.74 watts for miscellaneous loads, 2.4 watts for lighting, 
and that's on a per square foot basis, and you want 10 watts per square foot, I don't see a sense of shared responsibility there. I see somebody like taking advantage of rebates in order to generate income and the historic character of the in setting supper. So probably said more than I, well, no, I, I think that's a reasonable position. So um, the next one is, uh, So that that's that actually gets into the whole current installation cost and rebate thing too. Um, watts per square foot. That I think comes in in the commercial code under the Teddy, the thermal energy demand intensity modeling. Um, yeah. Fair installation cost and rebate, 10 year target to consider currently published projections and improvements in energy trends like uh, urban to work and current as other African plans for old site better research. So this is, I, I'm gonna say we skip over this one because this is gonna be a dense discussion between energy modelers and solar folks. We're gonna need our glossary, um, part of it in place. And it goes to the same, it's under the same umbrella of what we just talked about, but it's not something that we can, I think, meaningfully tap into at this point. Um, return on investment, reinvestment forecasting. This is the same. That will be technical terminology and financial tables looking to inform us so we can inform the HTC and the community. Still on 14D? That yes. Was to 14D? 14 C and D, yeah. Okay. Is that, do you, I mean, you're sure. cool with that mm -hmm. as the energy guy? Thank you time we were in uh, E falls into that. Uh, F is really more of a statement. So we don't need to get into that one. Yeah, that'll be a tail end. Oh, we're cruising. We got through half, almost a full page. Um, the other one I wanted to say, okay, so 117 will be shared responsibility. And um, Lucy, you asked for a definition. And what I was gonna say is, we will actually need to have a discussion about, as a work group, what we feel in a recommendation to HTC, what that means, and give examples of it, like three right. stories of 10 foot ceilings, single glazed windows, cabanas, pools, versus I want solar everywhere. So we'll, we'll have discussion about that and the public can join in and all the rest of it. Um, one, 118 will be just a discussion that looks, looks back at where is it a pick applicable um what items and um other party involvement so we'll have a discussion about other party involvement and then we can overlay it to the items <laughs> and we can assign what those rules will be i think that it would be good to do that early in those two things early in the process so we're in this frame of mind instead of going from it's a like at the HDC, it's a porch, it's a pool, it's a historic structure. Let's stay on one topic and review all these and just put some notes in as part of mapping. And it, it'll, it should be relatively painless um, to be able to assign when other parties would be involved and how. What items, how? And this is generally to 14 through 17. Uh, no, I'm just saying uh, 117 and 118, again, facetious, are two more topics, one being shared responsibility and the other being other party involvement. Mm -hmm. And those will um, will pick up at, you know, when we're going, once we get this a little better organized. So we can actually call them number 18 and number 19. Yeah, yeah. 18 and 19. Oh, actually, 18 I is sample panels and use of existing overlay districts. Yes. So those will be, thank you. Um, those will be one. Let me get off the, it'll be 20 and 21. Okay. So we're actually on the last page here. Are we? 
Mm -hmm. Am I? No, no, no. Five of six. Well, no, like the last page of. Last oh no, mine stuck together. Sorry, <laughs> I was so happy. No. Oh yeah, the next is next step. So it's yeah. And oh, uh, I have a note. Lucy's idea of sample plan. So that's part of one of the items we'll add in. Parent items, group B, determine the, this is, I think, just a little more easy to digest. We're basically looking at uh, what are the kilowatt, what's the kilowatt hour load? So how much energy is being used over the course of time for homes constructed over the last X years with respect to their ceiling heights and excessive code required seven foot. What is the load introduced to the overall system for additional height and mass? So this is another part of a discussion where we as a work group are, well, if we have an outside group who can model this for us or a HERS rater, which I mean, you could do based on three different structures and get a, at least anecdotal uh, extrapolation, right? And you could say, well, for you know a, a, a typical Nantucket home, when you add another foot of ceiling height, you're adding this many kilowatts of use or this many watts of use. And that goes back to the topic of shared, these go back to the topic of shared responsibility. Well, yeah, I mean, even sometimes you look at the floor plans of some of these structures and there's so much wasted space, it's shocking. Yeah. yeah. And and then somebody may, you know, the guidelines aren't saying, well, just because you want excess in some people's mind, that you can't have it. I mean, that's not our work group's role. But we could say, look, if your our recommendation could be, look, you, you want like more than what your what your load requires under the state stretch code modeling. So we love you. We want you to do well. We want solar, but in your particular neighborhood, under these particular circumstances, you're going to need a ground array, or you're going to need a pergola, or you're going to need something else if you want all that solar, so that there's a shared responsibility versus just coming to the HTC, beating up the HTC, and then saying, "Well, we want to change the legislation." And I'm not assigning. I don't want that to sound like it probably did. I'm not being. Not trying to oversimplify it, but that's just been our experience at the HDC. Yeah. Is we come in, people come in, they they have applications they know can't meet the guidelines, and then we go to the select board, and then we get beat up because people think we hate solar kittens, puppies, old people like myself, and um, well, they bully you legally. Yeah, and it's just it's not fair. So what we're trying to do is make it fair and even for everyone, including the historic district. And, and I want to be clear, I think that as a result, not this particular part of it, but it, I think it's going to be a lot easier for people to get, um, be informed and get more solar than they are. Because part of this is an education process, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the relevance of the historic district? Why is it important? Why, you know, it's, that's why people come here. That's why they invest. That's why we're the hottest market probably in Massachusetts, if not the Northeast, even during this current downturn. Um, insulation, oh, and so 15A, um, so basically modeling what, what the load is for extra height. Similarly, mod B is modeling what the load is for only doing code minimum insulation versus using two by 10 walls and having more insulation. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in on this. Yeah, please. Minute, because there's a, a, many, many of these points, many of our numbers are parent items. And we've been talking about this from the beginning, um, kind of project or anticipate some, some real analytics mm -hmm. around this, mm -hmm. right? And I've done deep dives on a lot of this stuff already from a lot of different angles. Um, I don't have the resources to do it. I can it'd take me two weeks to do a decent house with the, all these components, you know, yeah. and do nothing else. What I can say is that I think we have a great opportunity to look at some broader studies. Massachusetts is first in the country 
that's insisting on all electric. Which is crazy. So be that as it may, that's where we're at. We live in Massachusetts. Yeah. For the time being. I'm <laughs> expecting that's going to be at least for our lifetimes. So I think that there are all electric studies that exist. We can pull them and start to understand the nuance of what we're asking. And I think what, what I wrote here is a performance matrix. And so all of these important critical points um, would bake into something like a rating or an overall performance review so we can get this information. Insulation is, is different all over the country. Nantucket does it different than they do in Sandwich, than they do in Boston, than they do. Really? Sure. So similar materials, but the intensity of materials is different. Do you think between Sandwich and Boston, there's a difference? Sure. Well, it depends on who's doing what, well, what kind of buildings there are. Right? Yeah, so yeah. that's all I'm saying. Regionally, there's going to be a different market. So that aside, that's just one component, right? And we have triple glazed windows and double glazed yeah. windows and historic windows. So I, I think it's important to get kind of these baked in uh, analytics that can speak to all of these things. Um, I don't want to get too deep in the mud. I think um, I think we can put too much emphasis on it. I, I think in the big picture, it's vital. And I agree with you. You've been really insistent on that from go. I agree with it. I think that understanding the performance uh, parameters of a building are critical to successful implementation of solar, right? You need to know what the building needs and put appropriate solar on it. I mean, if anything, maybe that's, uh, you know, our, our mantra as a group. How much does the building need or part of our mantra? How much does the building need? How much does the building need? And how much solar do you need to provide that? Mm -hmm. So every building is different mm -hmm. depending on the components of it. So if we start there, we can understand all those pieces. I'm willing to take a crack at the performance matrix so that we can use it as a, a constant reference point. I don't know. I don't think that we can solve that in this group. No, clearly. I mean, my note is outside resource. I don't disagree with anything you said. I think the applicability of a performance matrix, that concept is, you know, it's got utility and there's, there's a lot of overlay in some of these paired items. And in the original concept, one of the original items we discussed, which was minimum kilowatt required for the typical Nantucket build out. And I think that performance matrix gives us an opportunity, depending on how you put it together, to simply apply that information to a structure that comes in. Look, it may be that if somebody wants, and I'm not suggesting this right now, but it may be that if somebody wants some, what the HDC determines is just an egregious amount of solar, um, and it gets remanded to us, that you need to validate it with energy models that the layperson can understand. And just like a foundation comes in and somebody wants to rip it out, the independent third, independent third party verifies it so that there's a, another you know, set of eyes that are, are experts who can say, well, yeah, this is what they're looking for and this, this is consistent with their load. Then the discussion becomes, does it under the shared responsibility model, because you need it doesn't mean you get, you know, you, you build three stories, 10 feet tall, and you have single glazed windows and minimum, keep in mind code is minimum. So you have minimum prescriptive insulation and so on and so forth. Nothing dictates that you have it on the front of your roof in the historic district. What's the other solution? And then we go into the matrix of the things we've talked about, other potential solutions. Certainly ground array is local, it's on the site, but maybe it's something else. Maybe people like that get together. This involves obviously discussion with other people like our, our energy director. Maybe people get together and they fund, you know, they buy forward and they get into buying, helping to purchase town solar on, you know, they're going to do the DPW. They're doing about a fifth of the, the roof, solar facing roof. Maybe people buy in and they, you get an opportunity through the town to, you know, it's it's like a, you know, I don't want to say profit sharing, but a rebate sharing and a cooperative. Yeah, and you get an opportunity so that it doesn't have to be on the front of a historic home. Again, those are discussions we'll have later and we'll get into that will also come into that discussion. And we talked about other party involvement. Mm -hmm. 
But um, the performance matrix, I think, will be helpful with that, as will the minimum kilowatt required for typical Nantucket and build out. I'll strategically reach out to the resources that I have at NREL and DPNL and the other acronyms that I won't bore people with here and see if we can get some some information on studies that have been done. Okay. Um, overlay districts. We're, we got two items left. What time is it? We're 4. 30. Okay, so we're in pretty good shape. Um, I wanted to get the planning board, but legality related requirement. Okay, so overlay districts. This is more of a um, kind of the administrative side of uh, Tim, I believe. Uh, Act Smart. He's Act Smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Solar company installer. And um, I think Andy came up with the maybe shared idea of the overlay districts. The, what we need to look into here are, are and not that when I say we, I mean as a work group, this is something we would be directing. Um, it's not something we're going to be doing the research on. We'll need, you know, an outside resource. Uh, we would, you know, just kind of executive manage the concept and the deliverable, uh, determine the deliverables and have someone provide it. But legalities of an overlay district within the historic district, within a national historic landmark, what type of effects could that have on uh, contributing structures? What type of situations could develop, right? We don't want to just come up with a, a solution and not try to reasonably foresee unintended consequences. And we have contributing structures in areas that aren't within the designated old historic districts. And if there's an overlay district, for instance, and this home is within it, there's a conflict because one part of our guidelines says you're in the overlay district where you can have this. And then the regulatory theme and practices say absolutely not on the front of a historic structure. Uh, and again, we're talking about current old tech, these big rectilineal panels that have no historic reference point to roof shingles. So that's part of looking into legalities and related requirements. Also would be, you know, literally what's required to have an overlay. Um, we're not a 40A historic district. Uh, we are under a special act. That special act leaves much, if not all, of these determinations subject to certain public notice and, and processing um, hearings, perhaps hearings, to uh, establish um districts or at least review districts um there's a much bigger process in establishing the historic and historic district itself i'm not going to pretend to know the details of it all i'm just saying like that's another part of why we would need an outside resource because overlay districts sound good in theory but it's not like zoning where town meeting just simply says yep that's it and then there's the only conflict is non-conforming uses prior to all of the conflicting things will be going forward for the HDC because we, for instance, may have a historic structure there. So there's a lot to identify. Um, and then it also needs, not only are the kind of legalities, but how would we re determine what is an appropriate overlay district for purely solar? Now, clearly, like if it was designated as the landfill, oh, which, by the way, has one it would be easier if it was within the bounds of the town property at the landfill. But what are the characteristics? What are the um, historic architecture or lack of historic architecture metrics? What are the viewscapes? What are the rural characteristics and settings that we as a work group are comfortable recommending do not need to be in place to have an overlay or if they are in place, can't have an overlay? No, protected so, habitat. Pardon me? Protected habitat. Protected habitat. So there's a lot of intricacies with this one. Um, and I, I, I'm just trying to scope out what it really, what what the item is I, I presented so you guys can add to it. So protected habitat. I mean, you could get that in danger species and that advance. Mm -hmm. The frogs, the tarantulas. Could I say, oh, 
Five tarantulas. What's the other one? Don't we have a fern out here? There's a lot of stuff. I have a butterfly in my property in place. We're restricted to mowing. Mm. Really? Yep. Huh. This is another good example of um, other stakeholders, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, getting yeah. other people involved. Yeah, yeah all certainly involved, right? right? And, and yeah. uh, you can imagine a few other work groups evolving out of this mm -hmm. legal, all of those parts. So, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and not to suggest that we're in any way by talking about this thinking we are going to set a policy for the island and where no, this is more to start the discussion of uh how and where does it fit in at all. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just no, it's fine. I, I was done, but invariably we're not creating policy, but we are planting seeds of opportunity. Yes, I like how you put that. Yeah, I have wetlands. It's not for the wetlands. Yeah. Um, bear with me, I'm just making notes. Um, okay. Waste stream reclamation. So rec waste stream reclamation comes into the concept of a bigger concept of shared responsibility, which is the community overall. Part of this, I mean, Heidi didn't read this whole thing, but um, <laughs> Jesus, I you mean, wrote it. I know. Well, it's been, you know, what was the date on this? August 2nd. Uh, I initiated uh, July 21st. This is, a, I mean, let me just say this is a really complex topic for people to think that we can simply say solar, yes, simple. It, it doesn't really, it doesn't kind of honor or acknowledge the a responsible solution that's very forward looking for the island for a decade or two. Mm -hmm. I think we, you know, we're in a different place than we were when the original guidelines were written. Solar was still kind of like an emergent technology in a sense. It was also not being widely utilized on the island. Currently, we have a situation where solar is, um, you know, it's being pushed as an energy alternative. I'm not saying pushed in a bad way. There's no uh, derogatory nature to that. But it is being pushed and it's being, you know, there are a lot more applications coming in. So, um, and we anticipate that that's going to continue and grow. And part of what we want to do is make it easier for those for certain things to be acceptable and get them accepted and move on. But at the same time, we want to outline and kind of anchor where it doesn't make sense and why so people have an education about it. Um, waste stream comes into that whole big picture in a sense because one other point is as the technology, so microchips, uh, computer microchips, every, I think the, the, I can't think of the name of the battle who came up with the law. But basically, every year, computing power doubles. Mm -hmm. And solar is going to get to that point. There's going to be some inflection points with respect to materials that are used and how quickly those can be advanced. The relevancy of that is that um, in, some, in some instances, we are going to have solar that's put on buildings that still has a useful life. But it's like when your mortgage when the interest rates go down, it makes more sense for you to get a new mortgage. It's going to make more sense for you at some point, if solar rebates are in place or not, to take all of it off and put on the new technology. Um, this gets into concepts of those types of concepts and what is the effect on our waste stream. And I read an article uh, in the LA Times not too long ago about how uh, California is literally grappling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and having serious issues with where to put solar that's coming off buildings. That is not to suggest, to be clear, if anyone's at home eating popcorn, um, or when you are, that we're using this to kind of disenfranchise or delay solar. But I think a responsible community discussion is, how do we deal with that when we're closing our landfill? Well, I think it is responsible. We're trying to be responsible about energy use. And this is part of it. Mm -hmm. You have to think about it. I agree. Yeah, it's part of the picture. And the marketplace is responding in real time, though, because of the pushback, because 
that's been sloshed about by people that are anti-solar to suggest that, well, you don't have a solution for end of life. Well, if you're not getting the solar that you need as a country, then you respond by figuring out how to make it recyclable. And that's happening real time. So not to say the ones that have been installed for the past 20 years are not intensive because I'm sure they are. I don't know. I don't know the details on the, the footprint and the global warming potential potential and the waste fill, the landfill uh, consumption that they take. But moving forward and 10 years from now, they're probably going to be almost exclusively recyclable. And so once it won't be long, inevitably. But you're raising great points because we want to be able to respond to the evolution of the technology. So it may be that we insist that, or the HDC parameters insist that it's a recyclable material. And those are well documented through their environmental product declarations. And so those things exist. Yeah. And, and then part of that recyclable nature, Jimmy, just to touch on it, is going to be, it's on both sides, right? It's on the design side. Um, so it's preemptive. Solar panels are being designed to be more easily recycled, like a catalytic converter and a muffler can, you know, it's a discrete element, not the exact same, but just it's simpler to take out. It's designed that way. And and recyclable, the recyclable nature of solar PV really doesn't seem to have been a consideration in design. <clears throat> On the other side of that coin, there's a vast amount of this material. So the recyclable technologies are going to advance. So you've got two different, two different. Um, I don't know what the right word would be, but uh, initiatives to, and it's it's driven by you know it's a capitalistic program. It's how do we do better because we can sell more um, on the on the designing it inside and on the other side we can get more materials out. So, um, but the request recyclable is an interesting concept. Is there are there other ones you guys can think of on how the HDC or even the community when you know we're reaching out to others to become involved um, might might approach this concept of where does the waste go? Well, how about the, the home homeowners installer being responsible for the recycling? And how does that usually happen in the market? So that would be probably like a bonding. So there would be something like you, you know, maybe a subject to a certain maximum. And I'm not necessarily suggesting it would be the HDC because we don't really have that. No, but I think it is good for us to think about this, even yeah. if it's outside. Yeah. Like asphalt to recycle. Yeah. Well, well no, I'm, I, I'm saying to your point, who's responsible and how typically that type of, a, it's a liability. Right. Yeah, and I think typically, how that should be responsible. Right, but but for the installer. Well, so that that the homeowner is responsible right. for the installer. But I would take it one step further, and that is how is that liability typically handled? And it would be, you might have insurance, you might have a bond that you will pay. You know, construction, you are um, responsible. It's a contract with the installer. Yeah, but the, the, somebody needs to hold that. Installers go out of business. Homeowners sell their home. They don't, that doesn't transfer. There's not a repository for this. All oh, I'm saying is, okay, let's say you've got solar collectors for yeah. 15 years old on your house and you want to upgrade. The, the name of the game should be that the person who's putting on the new array. Array, whatever array is responsible for getting the other ones to be recycled or mm -hmm. so the car battery approach so basically you take your car battery and now yeah. to napa as part of the process and they ship it's it off to a recycling and there's a fee yeah that's i that squares that okay yeah, yeah. do it that way you don't want to get into this bond business that's yeah just, no it'll be that's turn off it's, no and then inevitably the company's gone out of business yeah, yeah. yeah. to do it yeah. itself anyway that all sounds reasonable but the the challenge is to discover what the overall impact of those installations are. You can't you can't charge someone for something that we can't quantify, right? So does it have to be shipped to New Jersey because that's the only recycling facility on the but east coast? That, that's the installers part of their bidding process. You know, 
they're going to know that if they if they want to do work on the entire right right yeah. right mm -hmm. and again so well, this is not they want to be responsible no yeah, we're trying to save the world right. i mean if you're going to pitch that but work it on both then yeah and i think that's also part of the shared responsibility you know don't come in and say we had a 30 story structure you know 30 story 10, three 10 foot stories and we're not willing to try and help minimize the effect on the waste stream on the highlands. Does this is this going to be HDC stuff? No. This the no, HDC is not going to be but but these can be components of the discussion to help inform it's people. Be like dealing with the household Yeah. It's in, in a way, yeah. You're responsible. Car battery and household stuff. Yeah. They yeah. Can just they'll have another bin for solar. No, yeah. they just you know the installer bring the stuff over here. It's got an empty truck going back. No, yeah, and the materials are valuable. And then it goes to China. I, I'm just wondering that can some of those like you know the the minerals all those the problem is with extraction process tacking intensive. Yeah, the extraction process uses more energy than you can. You get a nascent <laughs> amount of material versus the waste product. So once they develop a system, maybe where the film goes, so you you have this and the film is actually behind, instead of being melted into the, uh, bonded into the protection panel, the polycarbonate, whatever it is, it's adhered to it with a particular material that a particular environmentally friendly product, once it's separated, can, just literally spray it on and the stuff will fall down into a vat and then the plastic the polycarbonate goes to be reutilized somewhere and the, the minerals and the metals can then be separated right now it's like melting your radio and separating those things out well not your radio it's like melting tiny little particles you can't pick up the metal with uh, a magnet computer it's, chips yeah computer chips nanoparticles yeah <laughs> Okay, so I think right. we covered, you know, we're at the point where um, I'm thinking we got further than I thought, and there's no way by Thursday next week I'm going to have re-aggregated all this. Um, so let me think about that, because I did want to get on a regular schedule, but... I, I think once a week is a lot. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be Thursdays? Yeah, we can revisit that. It's just yeah, that Thursday was teaching Wednesday afternoon. Okay. It's just that uh, Thursday ten, seemed to be the days we met for HDC that we weren't anymore. We so. get all burnout. Well, because we're back on Thursdays, I guess. No, oh. no, not regularly. Oh. We just have the OFC one next week to try and get the advisory groups up and running. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we didn't. I, I mean, look, I, I don't want to. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get into it because we didn't. Oh, I know. All I'm saying I just, is that we try to make your life easier. Yeah, it's just, it, it just the current situation is frustrating to everyone. And um, you know, I've had some frank and honest discussions with different people, and no one is opposed to it if it's done in a way that reflects on everybody's needs. So that's what the OFC is getting involved for. Um, anyways, what are so go ahead to speak to the next step is it time to go yeah almost. almost okay we got one minute but just yeah. speak to the next step and how we all may be helpful or i don't know if we could be um but it sounds like we need to sh shuffle all the cards throw them on the table and then reorganize them in order of priority right uh priority and importance so timeline timeline and so there's importance and timeline and priority will will be part of that you know what I mean? I do. So it's not a nothing so simple as ever easy. Your notes. So I'm the bottleneck. Your notes exist as the bottleneck. So how you guys can help is if you sit down and you listen to all the meetings mm -hmm. and then you write it out, <laughs> then that would be a big help for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have to build a set for the school. Yeah, we're really busy on Saturdays. So I think realistically, let's just look at a calendar. I mean, I think I was going to say the next group meeting could be prioritizing all that. Well, I, everyone has something to work off of. The problem is, is I, I need to put it 
all this stuff we've talked about two weeks. into the model. In two, two months, items. two months, two months. Yeah, I went two months. I want to look at the calendar. Wait, it's it's okay. four fifty six. Can you correct it? The the no. the gap was because of the holidays. Well, I was sick and then you were sick for two weeks. Yeah. And pretty miserably, by the way. No sympathy, no complaints. Just saying, it was COVID? really bad. Mm. He was in the hospital, right? Well, I was staring at. Mm. Not like for extended stay, but. But that blow bit and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I had that really nasty sticky plan that ended up putting him in intensive care. So the plex all that was a good help. All right. So January 26th. Are there is there a holiday in February? Yeah, that was my birthday. birthday. Valentine's Day. That's a national holiday in no Presidents is until the 20th. I think we could shoot for next, not this Thursday, but the following. So the ninth. And um I just have uh, some conflicting family things that uh, I just have been returning my country. Yeah. So I'll do my earnest level best. Go we'll ahead. Project. We yeah. also have an HCC meeting that day. Oh. Well, figure it out and let us know. Okay. But I mean, are you guys, I, I, I the thing for me is more important, not exactly the day we meet, but are you guys reasonably comfortable with the fact that we're making progress, we're mapping things out, we're going to start hitting the road on our maps, travel, and you're comfortable with the fact that we may not meet next week, we might not meet Thursday the following week, but we might set up like on Monday or Wednesday. I mean, is it generally, are we feeling okay that we're progressing and we understand we need to be, we are going to be, and we do need to become a little more focused on the next step or are people feeling like, well, we're wicked behind and, you know, we got to do more every week or I, I need a general understanding of where you guys. Well, why don't we figure this out in two weeks after you've done your homework? Thank you, Lucy. I'm okay with that. If I, you think, guys are I think okay. we need that. Yeah, we, need, I still, we need your notes. Still we don't have our notes. Okay, that's fair. For me. No, that's fair. That's fair. I'm just trying to, I, you know, trying to facilitate all different aspects. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot on the paper. Yeah. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in here, and I don't think anyone has clear vision about how this is all going to fall when we throw the cards on the table. So I think okay. we need some guidance. So that will be you. That will be one of our, you know, probably what will happen is I will put this together and then I will try to as painlessly as possible run us through it. And then you guys can ask questions, and then we can have a discussion about. Not exactly where we're going next, because that is actually going to be a process, but just how we feel about it. Are we missing something big? Do we need more time? Do we need to meet more frequently? Those types of things. I think that's worth a meeting to have that discussion. Okay. I just want to make sure we're I, all on the same I, page. And if not, I think otherwise we don't have a path forward. Yeah. So I think we have to do that. And I think that would be the proper time to get everyone that's on the call that's watching, or not on the call, but watching on YouTube, get them, get them engaged. No, no, but yeah. we need to have a group meeting right. where we're going through all of this. Yeah. And then we can get to the nuts and bolts of the, the work. Right. And I, I'm going to broadcast. We're going to, when we get into that, we're going to have to structure our public involvement. And it's probably going to be not as These are really good, as right? the short term rental group where you kind of get. You have very limited input, but we're going to need in order to control discussion for productive end. We're going to have to think through that. We'll have a discussion about it. I'm not going to make a decision. Yeah. Well, maybe we should have a public meeting somewhere. Well, let's have our first meeting. Yeah, let's and the yeah. next meeting, and then we can take from there. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's patience and input. You guys did a motion to adjourn. Oh, oh motion to adjourn. On your motion, aye. Aye.